The subject of the treaty has now become somewhat of a vexatious one and become highly politicised. It's hard to talk about it without it becoming heated and without getting glazed eyes looks. Regardless of where you stand on the treaty, even if you believe either it was a capitulation of sovereignty or an equal partnership, somewhere in between, have you ever thought about why, why there, was there was even, even a, treaty a treaty in the, in first, the first place? place? Not even the first one, I might add. What about considering or taking into account the circumstances the country yet sovereign found itself in around that period, looked at the motivations on both sides, looked back at history and not Facebook. That's what I'm about to do today, provide some well needed historic context. Let me start this with something that will help us find our feet. A map of Europe in 1840. When that map was drawn up, Britain, Austria, Russia, Prussia and the Ottomans were in a conflict with Egypt, France and Spain in what was called the Ottoman-Egyptian War. 25 years prior, Spain was fighting France and England was at war with the Ottomans. The point I'm making here is alliances came and went, borders ebbed and flowed, kings and queens held sway and they bonked each other. The Spanish were Spanish and didn't consider themselves connected in any way or fashion to Sweden, vice versa. The concept of an Italian and being a European, the same as say the Dutch, was heresy. Let's now change the map a sec. Replace those European countries at the time with say Maori Iwis. Tribes fought each other. Borders changed, the population was ruled over by kings of some frame. Ngāti Awa considered themselves Ngāti Awa and not Naitahu, and vice versa. The concept of Māoris being one nation, heresy. Keep this all at the back of your mind as we get into this. The first time Māori tentatively considered themselves a homogenised people, was with the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1835. That was signed by a loose confederation of Maori tribes based in the north of the North Island under the banner of the United Tribes of New Zealand. The English motivations to get some form of a deal strung together with the natives in 35 was to prevent France laying claim to the country. In 1835, New Zealand was all but a vassal state of Australia. New South Wales was the regional head office we reported to. Formative Old New Zealand was a seat of your pants type operation. Dead broke till gold turned up in Otago in the early 50s. The first election where the public got to decide who governed them wouldn't happen till 1853. And what was in it from the Maori signatories perspective? Well, they could codify their agreed borders using the European example. The French could go on being French within their own borders, do Frenchy things, smoke unfiltered gilwars. The Spanish within theirs, sparing frightened cows, for example. If another iwi invaded, England would come to their aid. The other main reason for them to sign, I'll get to shortly. See, that map at the beginning was useful explaining things, wasn't it? Let's look at New Zealand at the time now in greater depth. Get down and dirty. And dirty wasn't just a turn of phrase either. Just two months after signing the Declaration of Independence, Charles Darwin came sailing into the Bay of Islands on a whirlwind visit. He described Russell slash Waitangi as the hellhole of the South Pacific. I've done a video on that. Picture the worst write-up you've ever seen on TripAdvisor, and then multiply it by 10. So what was the makeup of the people at the time? In terms of Europeans, there was a meagre 15,000 in the entire country, of which a good half you would place in the category of itinerant fortune seekers, whalers for example. Pubs were nightly seen from once were warriors. In England, New Zealand had a reputation as the Cannibal Islands, 
the Church of England even had trouble getting people to become missionaries here, Africa was seen as a safer bet. Unsurprisingly, families didn't see it as a safe place to settle. It was the Wild West in the remotest place on the globe, unless you preferred the South Pole. The French could have taken the entire South Island with a few frigates and a couple of hundred troops. What was loosely a government at the time not only had external competitors to contend with, down at the bottom of the North Island and the top of the South, the New Zealand Company, our version of the Dutch East India Company, thought they could do a better job at running the spot, said Planck, settlers and they had begun making motions to start their own state, separate to the rest of the country. It's questionable if head office back in England would have been that worried either way. Had the French taken part of the country or the locals followed the route of America? Autonomous division had happened of course in Canada already. This was an outpost with not a lot going for it. On the other hand, from Britain's perspective on a global scale, there was a financial prerogative that meant it was worth the effort keeping the lucrative opium trade in China going. Politically, sending troops to Afghanistan to prevent Russia encroaching into India made sense. New Zealand, on the other hand, timber and gum came out of the land, bugger all else of value. Strategically, Australia was a better base. It was a cost-negative situation, which logistically was a nightmare to service. New Zealand in 1840 was a vastly different place compared to today. Where I live, Christchurch, saw the first European settlers arrive there in 1840. Two families decided they'd make a go of it, brave the wilds. They found insects were rife and realised the hard way, by going hungry and almost starving, that there was little to no way of making a living. They packed up and left within two years. Place a modern day New Zealander into this environment and most would have their lifespan calculated in months. Going down the mines for 10 hours a day provided more stability to the average Englishman versus chancing your arm in an unstable country that took 100 days at sea to get to. If all this negative feedback so far hasn't put pay to your romanticism, well, all of those aforementioned one star from five write-ups pale against the two larger issues plaguing the colony. Number one was a messy internal war that had raged on and off for a quarter of a century. The musket wars cost the lives of between one and five or one and four Maori, depending on which stat you look at redrew tribal borders, meant you took your life into your own hands, leaving your own enclave. Maori had become weary of the infighting, and ground down in a similar fashion as what happened in World War I. Only, as you see on the map, the no man's land was measured in thousands of acres, probably best called Indian country. And thus, the first treaty was a step towards a peaceful resolution. Number two, disease. Measles, typhoid, scarlet fever, TB, smallpox and poxpox laid swathe not just to Maori. Maori were just the worst affected, having no immunity to the new virulent diseases. Wonder why they had so many children back in the 1900s? It was odds on you would lose at least one child in infancy. The first hospital in New Zealand, Auckland, wasn't built till 1847 and that was built to attend specifically to address the pressing health needs of Maori. Between the death toll, infighting, disease and the overall lower birth rate for Maori, some predicted the race would become extinct. That's the historic background to the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi on the 6th of February 1840. By far the majority of citizens, 80% of whom were Maori at the time, thought it was a good idea in principle. Now getting back to that initial theme of the video, the question I first posed, why was there even a treaty in the first place? The simple answer was, most people accepted it was time we got on with each other. Created some badly needed semblance of order stemmed the intertribal wars by uniting Maori. This signing led to William Hobson, Britain's consul at the time, to proclaim sovereignty over the entire nation. 
and breaking regional ties with Australia just two months later, we could now go straight to head office. This is one of these rare videos where I've turned off the comments. I've done my best here to briefly outline the lay of the land as to the origins of what led to the Treaty of Waitangi. And that's where I would prefer to leave the subject personally. We'll never know what would have happened if no a treaty was signed. Some punitive action in the form of large naval ships being the most likely scenario. Suffice to say, it would have continued to be a remote location that generally wasn't a nice place for anyone to live. Had a rather bleak future. Anyone who argues the treaty wasn't a good thing is likely just looking through a modern lens. Can't offer an alternative for the time. There would be no New Zealand as we know it without the Treaty of Waitangi. No one nation. Thanks for your time today. That video on Darwin's slating of the place follows. If you found this video interesting, pass it along the backs. The main way my channel grows is by fellow Kiwis spreading the word. Pressing subscribe. Bye for now.